Good afternoon, everybody. You're, you're most welcome. Um, and we're beginning our autumn series on the UK and on Brexit with a, a very respected and very renowned uh, British politician of German origin who arrived in, uh, in Britain in her late teens and I presume met a man instead. I met several. <laughs> <laughs> And stay here. Right. <laughs> um, she was elected uh, Labour MP for Edgbaston in the West Midlands um, in '97, I think, and remained uh, in Parliament as a Labour MP until the last election in 2017. She was very involved in European matters uh, in her time uh, in Westminster and was a parliamentary representative uh, on the Convention, which eventually led. To the, to the Lisbon Treaty. Uh, she's a leaver rather than a remainer, and uh, we don't get very many leavers here, although we've had some, including Owen Patterson. And uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you and to listen to what you have to say. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, and uh, I was warned that I'm walking into the lion's den, uh, but having been to the Streatham Labour Party meeting last night, uh, there's nothing you can do to me, I'm afraid. Uh, <laughs> and I want to start by saying that having read sort of one press notice about me coming here, that I'm probably going to terribly disappoint you. Um, because first of all, uh, I'm not just sort of Nigel Farage in a skirt, uh, sort of the, the UKIP sleeper in the Labour Party is this rabid lever. Um, I'm also not someone who fears the word federal. Uh, I grew up in a federal republic. It's not an F word. Um, so I arrived at my conclusions as to why I ended up a lever uh, for uh, reasons which I'm happy to go into. The other thing is... Um, I'm unlikely to shed any light on what I think the settlement for the Northern Irish border is, and there are several reasons for my caution. First of all, uh, let's be blunt, I have neither any negotiating authority, nor am I part of the government, nor since stepping down in 2017 do I have a vote. And uh, I can see some of the difficulties, and I'm making some of observations of things which have surprised me, and which may lead us to a solution. Uh, but the solution, I think, will be found in a setting which is outside the public megaphones. Uh, it will be found if there is political will. Uh, and they will be found if people want to find them. Uh, I, am ex I was exceptionally surprised by the tone Michel Barnier took, uh, given that he was part of the team uh, which actually negotiated the uh, accession of Ireland to uh, the then common market. He was part of the Good Friday Agreement, uh, and some of the sequence of the negotiations uh, which he insisted on uh, did surprise me. Uh, I also was kind of surprised by uh, people's approach to history. And I'm, this is the only time in my political life where the fact that I'm German by birth actually does cause me trouble, because I know there are some things I don't understand, in instinctively understand, whereas I do instinctively understand them about Eastern Europe. Uh, but I just want to sort of just remind you that in 2017 at the general election, you had a whole generation of first-time voters in Northern Ireland for whom the troubles was a historical term. They were born since the Good Friday Agreement. I was very surprised that key people of the Good Friday Agreement, on the one hand, Trimble, on the other one, Blair, uh, uh, in the context of Brexit, came up with very different opinions as to whether this was or was not a threat to the peace process. Uh, so my, my real word is get off the megaphone diplomacy. Uh, open brackets. I find it interesting that when it comes to Ireland, the negotiations with Brussels have to go Brussels via Brussels to Dublin. When it comes to Gibraltar, the negotiations, a lot of them go in between Madrid and London. Uh, but just park that thought. Uh, and uh, I do hope that the, the common endeavour to find a solution will, will allow us to find one. 
Shankar Singham from the Institute of Economic Affairs makes the very important point, and I come back to that in a sense, is that when we talk about technicalities on the border, maybe we should focus on some of the problems we have in, in international trade uh, systems now globally, and that the European Union uh, drawing up its barriers is as much a problem to finding a solution. However, it takes me to why, given that I have no authority, I'm not negotiating, why on earth should you be listening to me? <laughs> well, you should be listening to me that, uh, on the one hand, I was an MP, a Labour MP in Birmingham for 20 years in a highly marginal constituency, and I've learned something which I think politicians have sort of forgotten for a bit, and that is listening to voters rather than telling them what they think is, is, is quite a good strategy. Um, someone did some research uh, about five years ago on behalf of the Labour Party, went out with Labour canvases in, in Labour heartlands, and they said on average it, was, it took 25 seconds into a conversation when someone on the doorstep complained about immigration that the Labour canvasser would say, you're just racist. Uh, you know, not giving people their voice is a problem. Uh, the second thing is I used to teach EU law, and then for two years I was at the Council of Ministers as a health minister. I would do the EU stuff, and then I spent 15 months negotiating the European Constitution. And I think it kind of taught me a bit on how things work in practice. And one of the things which I learned, or which I thought valued, is that in institutions you need checks and balances. And that was my original uh, um, reservations about the Lisbon Treaty. I didn't think they, uh, they, they provided much, and it was one of the reasons why, in the end, I, having been asked uh, by David Cameron to have an opinion, I decided to leave. If he had not, if he had not, if he had not called the referendum, people like me wouldn't have gone out and joined UKIP. Uh, but I thought the EU needs to change dramatically, and if 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 the United Kingdom had voted to remain, the, the the willingness to change at all would have gone. Even even further down 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 the drain. But anyway, we can discuss that. Uh, but so the referendum happens. Uh, I have I go out with a red bus arguing as to whether we spend 350 million and whether that's a gross figure or net figure. Uh, actually, what, what people what the, what the people in the Labour Party hated most about me doing this wasn't so much their different opinion. That was fine. Uh, but it seemed that I was having fun with Boris, um, and it was the enjoying ourselves, which was the thing which was so unforgivable. And um, the only thing I would tell you is spending time with Boris is that before the... Re if you look at the pictures at the beginning of the referendum campaign, there was still some colour in my hair. Um, by the end of the referendum campaign, I had gone completely grey, uh, which should uh, give some indication of how easy that is. Um, but the mistake I made after the, and I think a lot of us made, uh, after the referendum is that David Cameron said, this is a once in a generation uh, decision and whatever you decide I will implement. So I assumed that the government would take responsibility for the outcome. Uh, so we then have within less than 24 hours the prime minister who said I will do whatever you ask me to resign. Uh, and. Uh, there clearly wasn't the government taking any responsibility. They were just trying to make the best of what they thought was a bad job. Uh, which is politicians picking a fight with the electorate. That's not a good strategy. And that's why we ended up, that's why I ended up setting uh, Change Britain, uh, which has the purpose of trying to, to, to find common ground between the Leavers and the Remainers. And we've done a lot of polling and with a lot of... Uh, kind of just attitude stuff, and if you've got any questions, do, do come back. The only thing which would, would tell you is that two years' worth of polling, uh, there may have been a bit of journeying, uh, but opinions haven't changed. We actually reckon there's something like between 10 and 12% of what are reluctant Remainers. Uh, so they voted Remain, but with reluctance. And then once we had the Leave vote, they were going to say, yeah, get on with it. Uh, you have uh, now, I think, about... 30% of the population that still wakes up in the morning weeping. Uh, you've got about 30% who go and say, just out, out, just out, don't carry more. And you've got 40% in the middle who just say, could someone please stop talking about it? If I hear that word Brexit just once more, I will just scream. Um, and so there hasn't been a change, but what is still there, 
Kid you not, last week I had a student who helped with his dissertation. As he left the office, he, said, he turned around to me and he said, I voted leave. I still haven't dared to tell my mum and dad or my friends. So the, the kind of the leave vote is still seen one as the one you don't own up to. That's why I think be very, very careful with, uh, with opinion polls. Now, the, try and explain, because I think the, the whole reason why I'm here is because I think you need to understand what happened in the UK with that vote. And the best analogy is a little anecdote. Uh, 15 years ago, I was in Brussels, and John Bruton, Loisy Petterly, and I, we were the representatives for national parliaments on the presidium. And the national parliamentarians really loathe cheese gardistar. They're kind of so we would have the presidium meetings in the morning. The national parliamentarians were sort of just baying for the three of us having to come back after these meetings, and they thought they were being ignored. And it just got so we had one of these sort of real key meetings, and the three of us we'd absolutely promised we would see them at twelve o'clock. We'd have a two-hour session, and we go through things. And uh, rather than walking from the presidium building to the European Parliament, we thought it'd be quicker. We took a car. I think it may have been a car from the Irish Embassy. Uh, but we, we took a car. And then something quite extraordinary happens. That drive, I mean, any of you having taken taxis in Brussels, you know, they don't know the roads. They go all over the place. So unless you know where you're going, quite often you can get lost. But this guy just suddenly took us into places of Brussels, which we, none of us recognized anymore. And we tried to talk to him. And between us, we worked out that we had seven languages, but he clearly refused to understand any of them. And he'd occasionally, he, but he kept saying in, in regular intervals, there on the right. And we were going. So we finally decided we would wait till there was a red traffic light and we would just leg it. We would just get out of the car, which we did. And we got another car and we finally went back to the, to the European Parliament. They were furious because they thought we had snubbed them. You know, we had promised faithfully to turn up on time. And I remember saying to, to John, I said, we can come up with a story. But we just got to tell the truth here. We just got to tell them what really happened because it is so crazy. Nobody would believe, would think we would dare to make this up. Um, and I think that's what kind of happened with the British public. They're kind of once Cameron called the referendum, for them that was the kind of the red traffic lights of something they'd never really come to terms with. Uh, they they always kept pretending it was about trade and it was about nothing else. Uh, <coughs> And that was one part of the reason to vote leave. But the other one was, and uh, for those of you who take interest in the developments of the British Labour Party, there are, there are some new young people coming through. And one of them is the MP for Wigan, Lisa Nandy. And she recently gave a speech uh, at conference, And she said, the EU referendum should have made us alive to the reality that many people have lost control and agency over their lives. Later on, she quotes John Adams and says, the, the nation which will not adopt an equilibrium of power must adopt a despotism. There's no alternative. And that is what people thought, that they were being given choices. And when we said, who should have the final say over their laws, their borders, and their taxes, they actually wanted that to be in the hands of people who can remove it, who they can remove, which they felt in the EU context they never had. Which then, the second one you have to understand is what's been going on with referendums. I mean, I, I was struck uh, in, in, I asked the taxi driver here because I thought I hadn't read much about the, uh, the, the sort of subsequent feeling about the, the, the abortion referendum here and the acceptance. And he was saying, no, but people accepted it. You know, you have you say and accept. And I've, my experience is that you have a poll and the result of a poll is accepted. That did not happen this time. Uh, now, I think the European Union or other member states, unless they have to have referendums, uh, have been much more cautious about their use. And I, I went back to the, the Lisbon Treaty, which is, by the way, the one referendum I wanted. I wanted a referendum on the Lisbon Treaty in the UK because it would have given you very clear choices. Uh, and all three political parties in 2005 promised one, and then all three found reasons for not having one, which I thought was bad. But there were 10 countries who planned one, uh, if you go back. Spain said yes, France then said no by 54.7%. Uh, 
And the Netherlands, just remind, just remind yourself, the Netherlands rejected the Lisbon Treaty by 60, the, the Constitution by 61.5%. And after that, the other countries didn't hold a referendum. And you know, I, Ireland was asked to, to, to change its mind, uh, having been uh, uh, given reassurances about the Commission in 2008. Uh, and that's, I think that is, that is a difficulty, asking people twice about the same question because he didn't like the first answer. But I come back to that. I think what happened with uh, in, in the UK, the, Osborne and Cameron have always been obsessed with their predecessors. So if you went into the offices, you would see Blair's book, The Journey, in the offices. You know, Blair was the master. He knew how, how to do these things. And I think Cameron took, the, you know, got his copy of Harold Wilson off the shelf when he thought, I, I, I promised a referendum to the Tory party. How do I get through a divisive referendum where my own party is split and emerge a successful in the other end? Uh, he learned the first lesson, which says you pretend you've renegotiated. So he went off, gave his speech, asked for nothing, got nothing. Uh, uh, but uh, offices at something, but then didn't learn the second lesson, which is, you know, Harold Wilson's leaflets to the households in 75. One made the case for, one made the case against. Wilson stood back. You know, to this day, people aren't sure how Wilson voted. Uh, whereas he kind of took it so for granted that he would win, that not only did Whitehall not make any preparations, I mean, even for the Scottish referendum, we made preparations, uh, what would happen if there was an a independence vote. I mean, it wasn't done in that way, but for example, I was on the Defence Committee, and the Defence Select Committee, we did a paper called The Defence of the Realm, and it looked at such things of, where, what would you do with your nuclear subs if you couldn't use your fast lane, you know? Uh, so, so, but he, he prohibited any preparations to be made for that. Uh, so that is a real difficulty. And the reason why this is important is if you want to read an exceptionally good book, it's a book by Mervyn King called Alchemy. And get yourself the paperback edition because that is written since the referendum. Because up to the referendum, Mervyn was very careful. Uh, he thought he owed it to the office of the... the former governor of the Bank of England. Uh, and he makes the key point in there. In, uh, what alchemy refers to is the ability to create money. You know, modern trade requires a, you know, what, what is the source of trust for money? And for that, you require a sovereign. And in the book, he, he makes the case of that there is a continuous fight between the demands of democracy, the demands of international trade, and the, the, the existence of a sovereign. And that is one of the challenges for the European Union, by the way, or for the Euro countries. The, the question of who is the sovereign for the single currency is unresolved and will have to be resolved. But, you know, so, so that's one of the things. So I want to go into a few more of the, 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 the unresolved issues. Uh, in the United Kingdom, the unresolved issue is actually its own constitutional settlement. Uh, we've had, in the last seven years or so, a number of constitutional referendums. Referendum. I prefer the word referenda because it sounds nicer, but uh, those who know grammar tell me it's a ref they're referendums. Uh, so we had one on Scottish independence, uh, and the decision was that, the United that Scotland remains part of the United Kingdom. Open bracket, difficulty for the SNP, out of 1.6 million people who voted for Scottish independence, 400,000 voted to leave the European Union. So this notion which you see out there is if the SNP is this greatly united one bloc that's pro-European, may, maybe when not at home, but at home, and currently real tensions there. We voted on further devolution for Wales, uh, so uh, Cardiff was given greater powers. A referendum, which I may add, where the turnout was barely over 50%, and the winning margin was 0.7%, and nobody questioned the validity of the outcome. We had, a, we had a referendum on changing the voting system, the AV referendum under the coalition. That was defeated, and it was accepted. And then we had the EU referendum. And by the way, when I went up to, to, to Manchester, because we decided that I, I would officially receive the re result on behalf of the official organization, Vote Leave, uh, 
who, by the way, had nothing to do with Nigel Farage. We can come back to that. Um, uh, when I went up there, my, my working assumption was that if the turnout was uh, below 60%, Leave had won. If the turnout was between 60 and 68%, Remain had won. And if the turnout was over 60%, 68%, uh, Leave had won again. Uh, so we had a turnout of 72%, exceptionally high, and the winning margin was 3.8%. Uh, there's something like 40 MPs in the House of Commons who have got majorities less than that, and nobody says you're not legitimately elected. Uh, so you had a clear result. So, but, but that constitution... So, so in, in terms of how the United Kingdom people wish to govern themselves, they've made a sequence of very rational decisions. It's only the last one which is being treated as if it was irrational, and you have a government. But for the first time in my living memory, elites are refusing, or appear, give all the best impression, to refuse the outcome of a franchise. Second, real, real big problem, which uh, I, I think had a great role in, 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 in the, the rise of UKIP, is devolution in England outside London is utterly unfinished business. Uh, in 1997, we set up a Scottish Parliament. We give the powers to, 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 to Northern Ireland. We give big powers to, to London, the way it governs itself. And then, not only do they not further devolve to the regions of England, they even abolish the regional... Cameron devolve, the, abolished the regional development agencies, uh, had ad hoc city deals, and England felt it had no voice. Uh, there's some very interesting work going on by a Labour, former Labour MP, John Denham, who was a cabinet minister, and he is now at the University of Winchester, and he, he looks at Englishness and English identity and makes for the first time from, a left, from the left an argument for an English parliament and what that would be. And I think that's a real constitutional, structural problem which the, the United Kingdom ha has, to, has to address. And then, of course, uh, the, I think the last person who both truly understood uh, the constitutional structure, but also the role the United Kingdom could play within the European Union structure, was Tony Blair. Uh, but, and you know, when history books are written, uh, the decision to go to war in Iraq will be seen as one of the greatest tragedies. Uh, in terms of uh, the consequences it had of the Labour government not focusing on what was important. And just tell you an anecdote, it was a Christmas uh, before the invasion, and uh, Blair wanted a, a council minister. He, he thought they needed a president of the council because he thought the institutional architecture of the European Union uh, just was, was skewed. And I, I went to see him, uh, and he said to me, that is the most important decision which we have to make. And I sort of jokingly said, he said, oh, you mean more important than invading Iraq? And he said, oh, yeah, Iraq's not going to happen whatever we do, but we can shape Europe. And he was the, the only British prime minister who did so, his European involvement, not for sentimental reasons. It was his perception of a strategic interest. Now, whether he's right or whether he's now right, uh, read Ian Kershaw, uh, Helter Skelter, where he says we've underestimated the role of the nation state, state and I'm kind of with, with him on that one. Uh, but you need, you need to understand what's going on. So this is the unresolved things in the United Kingdom. Then you've got unresolved in the Eurozone, which I said it's, I think, the, who is the sovereign for the currency is a real problem. It comes back to your democratic accountability. If you want a federal structure, that's fine. But then you need pan-European political parties. And this notion that just because you call someone your Spitzenkandidat, because you had a few good dinners, and then sort of one emerges from one of your big parties, uh, you know, sorry, folks, it just doesn't wash. Um, and you, you, you really have to go much further than that. Uh, the 2018 European elections are going to be fascinating. And this is one of the reasons why I've got great hope that we, we will arrange uh, arrive at a deal. Uh, because if you, if you, if you think uh, the, the European Parliament uh, will be the same after that, who do you think Sweden's going to return its MEPs, Hungary's going to return its MEPs, Italy going to return its MEPs? In Germany, in Germany, the AFD is the official opposition. So, and, and the politicians are still not listening. 
you know, they, they say, that there was this fascinating article which said, Sweden shows us that prosperity it does not protect us from, uh, you know, populism. And I thought, what protects you from populism is politicians realizing that the purpose of political parties is to gather together people who broadly believe the same as you do, gather these opinions together, then you mediate the different conflicts. What you don't do is pretend it's not happening. That will then give rise to extremist parties. One of the good things, by the way, of the, the referendum in the United <coughs> Kingdom is the debate on immigration in Britain is going to be owned by the front bench. It will be the front bench of Labour and the Tory party which will design the new immigration bill. It will not be some extremist parties who, as a bloc, will hold the government to ransom. Um, so I think the European election. Similarly, the EU will have to get to the stage where they develop a proper neighbourhood policy which is not just offering membership of the European Union. That is the one big thing they have never managed to do. So when Spain, for example, joined uh, in 1986, they, they knew there was a problem with North Africa in terms of helping North Africa with immigration. So the only way they could get money to Morocco was Morocco actually applied to become a member of the European Union in 1986. So they have to get to a point where you, you, you don't just think that life is only about uh, application of membership. So bring this to an end, my, because this is about why, why the referendum says must, must be honored. It's a very strong, very Germanic, must be honored. Uh, will be honored, I shall say. Um, Mervyn King, coming back to him uh, on the Today program uh, a few weeks ago, said, you must ask yourself, how did the world's sixth largest economy, with a tradition of political stability and a reputation for administrative capacity, has got itself into such a mess? Because, you know, I, 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 just as when I go into another country, I never dare to suggest, to tell their governments uh, what they should do. Uh, I nevertheless uh, always say good things about my own government, whoever is there. But it is undeniable that... It doesn't just look very confusing from the outside. I can tell you it's pretty confusing from the inside, too. And part of that is uh, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, and I do not believe in the deep state, but I think it is the first time over the last few months that I've seen the deep state in operation. And there are a group of people who genuinely, you know, I'm, 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 I'm really not questioning their motives. I, I, I really do think they feel it is the right thing. But they think it is their job to stop this country from the folly of a vote. And therefore, don't allow it to happen. You have that combined with a foolish, foolish general election in 2017, uh, which deprived the prime minister of a majority. And not least because the electorate don't like being called to vote for, for political convenience. Uh, and you have a House of Commons that for the first time ever actually talks about a second referendum on the basis that we can't find a solution. So, to which I say, actually none of us politicians have the right to exist. We serve a purpose. So we can either go down the Bertolt Brecht route, which after the Hungarian rising said, what was this thing which said? Should, should not the government dismiss the people and elect another one? Uh, and I, or the House of Commons does what they're currently doing in Stormont and say, uh, as we haven't been doing any work, we take a 40% salary cut, or they sort of say we call a general election, but none of us will ask for re-election, because we've just said, we you know, the job you give us, which find these solutions. So they, that's why I think you've got a real democratic tension here. The, the political parties, with the exception of the Green Party, because they've only got one MP, and Clyde Cymru, are deeply divided. The fault lines are on different lines, but there's deep, deep divisions. There's a redefinition of what parties stand for going on. Uh, and that done with the fact that we are leaving the European Union. Uh, I think we will leave on March 29th. Uh, what I've seen over the years is that uh, there's nothing quite as wonderful as a deadline. Uh, I remember the deadline on some Turkish negotiations under the British presidency. 
uh, where they said 12 o'clock, you know, midnight, all bets are off, and they were going on and on and on. And Jack Straw came up with his ingenious idea uh, at about 5 to 12, saying, uh, in London, it's still 11 o'clock. Uh, so we, we arrived at the deal uh, midnight London time. Uh, uh, it is in Michel Barnier's interest to arrive at a deal. Uh, it is in the, the, the European Union's institutions to arrive at a deal because I think the dynamics of a new commission and the European Parliament is going to be quite different. But the key thing, absolute, and oh yes, and, and follow the money. I think the money also will play a, a significant role. Th 39 billion is a lot of money. And just remind yourself, I, I occasionally forget when I'm quoting figures whether it's million or billion. Uh, but remember, a million seconds is 11 and a half days. A billion seconds is 31 years. So, you know, there's a, there's a massive difference. And 39 billion is a big uh, bunch of money, which if the European Union has a problem with that, uh, would mean there are certain things they couldn't do. But the key, the key for me as a British politician, the key answer as to why the referendum result must be honoured is that all the tensions, all the conflicts, all the things which have led to the vote to leave would neither be resolved nor altered by another referendum. What they would do is, irrespective of where the outcome of that referendum would be, it would deepen the divisions. It would paralyze decision-making for even longer and actually make any problems we have just worse. And on that cheerful note, I'll sit down. <laughs>